Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, looks like, uh, good morning. It's my privilege to uh, talk to this premier institute, uh, postgraduate institute of medical education research in Chandigarh. And uh, thank you, Professor Anand, for the invite uh, to talk about something very near and dear to me, um, the implementation of yoga for healthcare practitioners, patients and public. Um, it is also my privilege to have been practicing Isha Yoga for the last eight years which has touched me uh, very deeply. And so it is a very nice advantage to marry the ancient sciences with the spiritual sciences. So I have no specific disclosures for this particular talk, though I'm NIH funded for other reasons. We all know that um, most of the physicians have an increased prevalence. It is also well known that some of us don't realize when we are stressed out that we are actually stressed out. So it takes a while for us to recognize that we are actually burnt out. And the Medscape, uh, which puts out these data from US talks about almost 45 to 50% of perioperative providers and also the other aspects of the healthcare providers having this kind of stress. So this is well recognized problem. As you can see, um, it has been published in many journals. Surgeons have had emotional experience of their everyday practice, especially the fork of making a decision and also medical students have been shown in most 160 universities all over the world you can see over the right corner there is a prevalence of depression and actually suicidal ideation almost 11 percent of the medical students and it's also well known about these in nursing and um, elsewhere so what is the solution for it many of these societies have actually recommended the impact of mindfulness training you can see here uh, from the nursing practices, also for the anesthesiologists, and also for the medicine. Uh, it seems like the solution is also well recognized, but it's not, you know, practiced. So that is a problem. There is a gap between the knowledge and implementation, despite the objective evidence. You know, there is a lot of neuropsychological questionnaires that, de that demonstrates the impact of yoga on and meditation on anxiety and stress. Despite that, uh, people wanting to see the objective evidence. So what is what is objective evidence that we have seen of late? People are able to demonstrate at the MRI using MRIs that uh, Sarah Lazar's group from MGH has shown that regular practices of meditation for almost three or more times in a week, uh, over six months or so increases the gray matter volume. There is also increased cortical thickening and um, this has been demonstrated in a very significant number of meditation practitioners. There's also conclusive EEG findings. There's a general slowing of your alpha and theta waves, which are the low frequency waves. And of late, uh, they're also showing increased beta waves that talks probably about increasing brain connectivity. So what is the implementation challenge? Why don't we actually practice it? There seems to be a lot of intrigue. Perhaps there is no one size fit all approach. As you all know, um, yoga that has survived for thousands of years, a lot depends on who gives it and how is it given to a specific individual. So there are broader set of practices could offer something for everyone. In that sense, a particular school of yoga, which has a broader offering can really help. So one such example is Isha Yoga. There are people who identify with body base to begin with. 
that is hatha yoga or mind based or energy based which are kriyas or our emotion which is de a devotion and sadguru talks about that as devoid of oneself as devotion not the typical way religious devotion is um, understood yoga is perhaps the way of life and exploration of other things should be a uh, build on top of that so from us what have we done about this one thing we have done in our institute and uh, similar like-minded people is just to first introduce some of the very simple techniques that people can actually do and practice. So we've done inbuilt in the grand round seminars to our departments of anesthesia at Harvard hospitals and also uh, to the hospitals in Massachusetts and somewhere else. We have basically conducted a, an hour and a half workshop. So you give the evidence, then you actually do the workshop, then you talk about the question and answers. I think it's very important to address the question and answers at the end to talk about what are their misgivings. Believe it or not, many people think that meditation is very hard to do and so it is not for them. So it is very important to remove that. And you guys have done tremendous job in your institute over the last decade or more to uh, enhance the science of yoga and kudos to you. And I'm preaching to the choir here. And we've also done some workshops at the Society of Education and Anesthesia and also the American Society of Anesthesiology. And to begin with, we have done evaluation of stress in perioperative departments. Is that a problem? First is to find, is that a problem? Or are we just assuming that? And then next is introduction of simple 12 minute Isha Kriya sessions, which are free online guided meditation. Over the last several years, as you all know, there are about 500, 600 studies on meditation and meta-analysis states that only the guided meditation has impacts on beginners especially. And we also formed a group of national researchers in US who had similar uh, like-minded approaches to explore mechanistic um, part of yoga, which is the hardest thing to do uh, because it also needs funding and building international partnerships such as the PGI yoga group. And first thing we did in these groups, or as you can see in this little study, we just gave it as a one-time administration and then looked at it. Did it change from before to after? We, I also mentioned that, is there a problem? So one thing we found out that among surgeons and anesthesiologists, um, this is about a large group. You can see that surgeons about 60, uh, sorry, 81 people, no, 61 people, anesthesiologists about 100 people or so. That's not a large, that's not a small sample size. You can see that the, using the perceived stress score, majority of them are in the moderate stress category. So low stress is 0 to 13, moderate stress, stress is 14 to 26, high stress is 27 to 40. Especially when you're younger, when you're in the residency or during the fellowship, you're at a high risk. And with this one-time administration, we did this in the morning hours, like 7 a.m. You're supposed to be fresh out of your sleep and going to work. And that was on Wednesday morning when the work starts late because uh, they have these educational sessions in the morning. I would never imagine that they would have a very high stress level in the morning time. And after you can see that in the surgery grand round participants, total mood disturbances using profile of mood survey, it was very close to 100. Higher the score, worse it is. And with just one time administration right after that, you could see within 15 minutes, uh, it came down. Similarly, in anesthesia conference participants during the morning hours, you could also see that with just one time administration, it came down. So what happened when you split this profile of mood survey, there is a positive subscale, a negative subscale. Positive subscales, as we all understand, will take time to change. So we didn't see any changes. But you can see all the negative effect, effects such as anger, depression, fatigue, and confusion actually decreased within one time. So the next question is it's sustainable, right? You can also see that in, uh, in industry participants or in almost 40 to 45 people, over a period of four weeks, we just gave Upa Yoga, that is pre-yoga, simple things such as yoga namaskar and directional movements, etc. Over a period of five weeks, you can start seeing these negative subscales actually going down. This is every week measured in week one, week two, week three, week four, the longer you practice, these negative subscales actually go down. Then we wanted to see the robust way of doing the study, which is looking at a randomized controlled trial in, uh, in perioperative providers. So this is clinicaltrials.gov registered study. We aimed very high. We looked at most 120 participants. So we have almost total enrolled 94. 
And actually you can see that 19 people, once they consented, withdrew their consent. And there are about two people are currently active and about one third were basically unresponsive after a few uh, you know, sessions. And last to follow up is nine. Only 27 participants have completed the study. So what we are understanding is in any study, there's enough intrigue in people. They want to start it. They sign up, they consent. Whereas one third of the people actually take it up, do the way it is supposed to be done and complete it. Another one third or pay, you know, they just, um, they have intrigue. They do a few lessons, but they can't sustain it. There's not enough carrots for them to sustain that. Another one third just don't care and don't do even one, one session. So we are also seeing that in patients who are undergoing cardiac surgery, we're doing a randomized controlled trial and we develop, uh, divided them into three groups. One, we gave them almost four weeks to start these practices. Another group where they started just on the day of surgery and continued post-operatively. Another group was a standard of care group. You can see the same story here, about one third of the people are actually doing what they're supposed to do. Now, we took this Isha Kriya meditation. We wanted to see whether it actually is compatible to other established practices. But in order to see that, we took novices and experts here. You can see on the left-hand panel and the experts on the right-hand panel. We took only about seven people, three experts and four novices. We put them, put them through regular Isha Kriya on a daily basis. We asked them to practice over six weeks. So we did a baseline measurement and then at six weeks, we measured them. You can see that there is a lot of um, alpha development. You can see this is a red zone, which means that a higher power of these alpha waves are seen in novices. And whereas gamma is not that much. Whereas in the experts, you can see that gamma is much more dominant than the alpha over a period of six weeks. This is the difference between what was seen at the six weeks compared to the four weeks. So even in novices, you could start seeing the slowing down of these, um, you know, waves with just a six week practice of 12 minutes a day. So then we went on to do um, inner engineering online, which is basically a seven online session. Our thought process here was, okay, it's not just enough to coldly introduce a practice, but you also need to supplement it with some kind of lessons on a daily basis, which talks about multiple things um, in order to sustain their practices. So we took almost 80 people and randomized them into two groups. And if this is too small, I apologize for that. And you can see on the right hand side, group two is a control group for the first four weeks. Group one is the intervention group. You can see the perceived stress score goes down from 19 to almost 11, whereas in the control group it doesn't because all they're doing is active reading for 15 minutes for that four week period. Then we cross them over. The group two, which is a control group, starts doing the uh, intervention the inner engineering online, whereas the active group stays in the active group. It doesn't cross over to the control group. You can see that the, the group two also reduces in the PSS score and goes down. And this is, we wanted to see when we start the study, what happened afterwards. It seems like some of them are falling down in their practices and you can see that perceived stress score starts going up. This is one of these waitlisted randomized control trial, which is as robust as it can get. So when you look at them as compliance, for those who just did one week of practices, um, the reduction in the perceived stress score was very less. For those who did two weeks of practices is very good. So it seems like somebody who spends enough time in learning these lessons in our engineering online and also does these Isha Kriya practices, they seem to have more benefits. So you have to have something else installed in order to have them be more compliant. And taking the next level, this is Inner Engineering, which is a flagship program of uh, Isha Foundation. Um, a group of investigators, including Deepak Chopra and the other members from uh, California, they basically sh did the same thing. That is, if you practice the uh, Shambhavi or the, Isha, um, the Inner Engineering, you do almost six times per week. Moderate is supposed to be one to six times per week. Low is inconsistent. You can see on the right-hand side, the perceived stress goal a stress scale for those who have optimum practices you see a large decrease in the perceived stress scale score and this one is for those with the moderate practices the horizontal line for for those who didn't have any kind of consistent practices so you can also see on the well-being score generalized well-being the well-being increases in those who practice optimum and a somewhat similar increase or to a lesser degree in those with moderate and those uh, who did not practice actually went down 
So consistent practices actually helps. Taking the next level, an intense program actually showed that uh, over three months where they did this um, uh, Anadi program, it's called, and you can see that there's a robust cortisol, awake, cortisol awakening response, which is very essential for immunity and other things, and threefold increase in brain derived neurotrophic factor. Akshay tells me that you guys had a, a review article and you all you know everything about BDNF, and a threefold increase is a huge deal. And with moderate intensity exercises, you don't even get to uh, a one or twofold increases with BDNF. And BDNF is also being central not only for neurotrophy but also for uh, immunity. In other studies that we have done with similar practices, what we have seen is um, endocannabinoids. This is the anandamide and BDNF. We can see with just a four-day retreat, there is an increase in anandamide, and there's also an increase in the BDNF. And all these neuropsychiatric scores, such as depression, anxiety, awareness scales, and happiness scores, uh, they all go up as it, their depression comes down and anxiety comes down. And uh, we did an eight-day Isha retreat, Samyama study. These are all committed people who actually do, has been doing practices for a long time. They do almost 60 days of intense practice to prepare themselves to, in order to do the survey. And you can actually see that um, time point two, this is before the intense uh, retreat. And then time point three, this is after the intense retreat. And this is almost 12 weeks of practices on the left-hand side, preparation. And this is a final survey that happens almost three months later. So we had actually practitioners as well as controls for this group. And you can see that those who had baseline depression had significant reductions in depression that sustained for a long time, almost three months. And anxiety score for those who had baseline anxiety score that also decreased. Interestingly, what we saw was if you look at the C-reactive protein level, for those who are participants with 60 days of practices, you had a very low levels of CRP. And then despite going through very intense practices, their CRP levels, not even comparable to controls, which is almost uh, three times high. Especially during this COVID times, it makes sense to have a very low CRP and you have to have immune resilience. So all this speaks for regular practices will really keep you at a, you know, very com in a good comfort zone and you'll really do well with that. Similarly, you can see the vitality score goes up, mindfulness score goes up, the joy score goes up, and similarly, the resilience scores goes up with these regular practices. So we are also doing a COVID-19 resilience building um, study. This is a worldwide study. I'll send the link to uh, Dr. Anand. Uh, this is for healthcare workers. We are providing all kinds of practices. If you have three minutes, you have a practice. You have four minutes of time in a day, you have a different practice. You have five minutes, you have a different practice. You have 10 minutes, you have a different practice. All we are saying is whatever you want, experiment in the first week, be consistent with it, stick to it, and do the practices. You will probably see the benefits over a long time. And we have a proposal for inner engineering online, a very detailed proposal, doing a very robust study. And we can share with um, uh, your group if uh, we want to collaborate in these kind of studies. And so with that, I will um, you know, thank uh, Professor Anand and the new group for listening to this, what we have done regarding improving the compliance. Whatever you take up, it's very important to stick to that practice and do it consistently in order to see um, benefits. I hope I've shown some data uh, to convince you that um, it is not difficult. You just have to stick to the practices and you just have to simply follow the instructions and others will tell you that uh, there, is, there are changes that you're, they are seeing within you. Thank you very much for this opportunity and um, have a good day and have a good weekend.